Hey friends, thank you so much for joining with us on this week's video. And I promise you, you're gonna to wanna to do yourself a favor, grab yourself a cup of coffee or a tea, grab yourself a pen and a notepad or on your phone if digital is your thing. Either way, there are so many points that you're gonna to wanna to consume and digest and then apply to your life so that you can grow. Don't go anywhere because there's a whole lot of goodness coming right now. Shall we begin? Hey friends, like I told you, here he is, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Seb Lavoie. It's so good to have you here, uh, uh, my brother. I think, uh, I think that we've surpassed just a, just a buddy stage, but you have become my brother. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate you. And I know the audience here on Real Cops, Real Life, appreciate you too, your input. And, uh, and as always, uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing what you, the audience, uh, will have to say in your response to the things that Seb and I will, will be saying here today. So thanks so much again, man, for being with us. Um, couldn't, I couldn't say thank you enough. Thanks for having me. Uh, and I'm just going to start out by saying that this is not a mustache video on how to get that. You're going to have to contact <laughs> Seb himself to get that, to get those tips and strategies from him. Today you have you have clicked on some stuff and now you're here uh, and I just wanted to open up with something very important. First and foremost, these things that, that we talk about on this channel are always just kind of our own opinions. We don't represent anyone. We don't represent an agency. We have jobs and we do our thing. But here on this channel, we just like to kind of pass along some of the information, some of the experiences that we've gathered through our positions uh, and, and to basically hand some of that stuff out to you so that you can learn from it, you can grow from it, and you can be encouraged. And my hope is that somewhere along your life and your journey, you will say, you know what, I was able to change, I was have a, a paradigm shift, or I was able to uh, start a new path, a new journey because of something you heard somewhere along the way. And today we're talking uh, to, to Sergeant Major Seb Lavoie because we, um, we want to dive into a series about leadership. Now, this is something that him and I have talked about uh, at length, and we both are very passionate about this topic. And it's such an open topic, but we are going to do our best, but we want to do it organically, but we're going to do our best to stream it along in such a way that you can follow through. So no matter what your position is, no matter what you do, no matter who your employer is, uh, if you are a person who is wanting to grow and stem beyond where you are right now, you want to make an influence and you want to, uh, to basically cast a vision so that others can get on board and even for yourself, because I think when we talk about leadership, we're going to say, how do I lead? myself. So today's video, I'm going to sort of encapsulate it into a phrase that says leadership uncensored, what it is, what it isn't, and why it's so important. So Seb, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to open up with a pretty big question, and that is leadership, what is it? Hmm. Yeah. Le essentially, leadership is, is, is having the ability to lead, notwithstanding a position. Having having enough gravitational pull that people actually want to follow you, getting a mission accomplished, whatever that mission might be, and do so with your people being healthy and well and, and, and them wanting more and, and, and being performance driven and, and, and as a team, um, you know, being productive. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. The old autocratic style, um, I'm the person in charge and, and you get to hear what I want you to do is just, it, it didn't work then, it doesn't work now. And we, and, and we know that there is so much out there now that, that we, know, we know what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a very complex, obviously field of endeavor, but um, I think we're gonna go over, you know, a lot of the, a lot of concepts and a lot of the, a lot of the sort of the moving parts of it over the course mm -hmm. of the, next little while. Yeah, I like that because what I heard you say in a nutshell is leadership is influence and it has various pillars um, that help the structure, if I will, the structure of leadership, um, which is in, and I, and I love that where you talked about, you said the word team, like, it, like it's a teamwork thing because I am also of the opinion that if someone is thinking they're leading, but nobody's following, all you're really doing is going for a walk. And uh, so I think that by influencing uh, others, 
for a common goal, for a common vision, for a common, as you call it, a mission, uh, I think is, is paramount to understanding, first of all, what, what leadership is. You know, I, I was uh, back in my old life, I, I, I did a lot of pastoring and a lot of that was with children uh, and young people. And when asked a group of kids, hey, what is a leader to you? And you wouldn't give them any kind of, um, you know, understanding of, of what truly a leader was. And their response, many of them, their response was something like someone who's really big and really loud. <laughs> so, uh, so I think I fit the description anyway. It's definitely someone who's... Stereotype. Big, yeah, the stereotype, very big and very loud. So uh, thank you for that. Now, let's talk about, because you, you said beyond the, beyond the role or beyond the position of leadership, Talk a little bit about, if you will, um, what leadership isn't, because I, I do believe that some people think because you are a blank and they can insert whatever manager, boss, um, you know, a ranked officer, whatever the case is, then you are automatically a leader. But uh, and I understand that that's a leadership role and a position. But so talk to us in, in, in that regard of what leadership it isn't and maybe sort of come against that that falsehood of what a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's very complex to go into what isn't, but I can I can safely say this, regardless of what industry you're in, regardless of what field of endeavor you're in, you're going to be asked to control chaos, right? That's essentially what humans are doing. And if we're high, highly performing human, we are going to be asked to control chaos in whatever field of endeavor that we are. And I don't know, unless you're wanting to, you know, sort of be on a, on a on a on a building chain somewhere where you you know all you're doing is you know uh, not that there's anything wrong with that but all you're doing is screwing you know screws into a, a, a you know a circuit board and you're doing that for 12 hours a day and you punch in and out and you know but even then it could be argued that after 10 years of doing it you're now a leader people are gonna ask you how to do it better and they're gonna ask you little tricks and trades that you have. Uh, to make things more efficient and all this stuff. So in, inherently, you will you will take a leadership role and that just happens organically and it does in any industry. So the question is, you know, I, and it, it always, it's always um, interesting when people say, I have no interest in leading. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that's up to you. Like eventually you are going to, eventually you are going to inherently. So you have two choices. You get good at it. Or you don't, and you continue thinking you don't need to lead, and then inherently, when you have to do it, you're not, you're doing it incorrectly, right? So, uh, in our field, in law enforcement, in first in the first responder world, it is absolutely critical that we have the ability that we have the ability to lead, and that is not necessarily being in a ranked position. That has to do with leading calls. It has to do with controlling chaos. It has to do with having people work together. It has to do with, if the call is yours, you're going to have to make some calls, you know, and, 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 and you're going to have to lead conversations with the members of the public. You're going to have to articulate yourself in court. You're going to have to lead the way in there. The, the, the amount of leading that you, that you do in the first responder world um, is incredible. The question then becomes, if you if you take the right route and if you take the right approach and if you if you organically grow as a leader and are always seeking to get better and interested in researching and learning and doing all these these other things, um, eventually what will happen through demonstrated competence is you will have you will have established credibility. So you establish credibility through demonstrated competence, and next thing you know, now people are following you organically just everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So you become so now you have a you have a civil and professional responsibility to be as good as you po you possibly can be. This is no longer in your hands. Mm -hmm. This is now out of your hands. Now you have to be as good as you can for the sake of the people that work for you or with you. That becomes a completely different thing. So now we're talking about purpose. Right. So when you start when you start when you start doing things with a purpose, you start paying you you should start paying more attention on how you're you're affecting that leadership yeah definitely and i think that when you say the word purpose i know a big question in some of those self development kind of ideals is what is my purpose as in what is what is my purpose in life and that is that's too big for for this channel right now at the moment to try to go down that avenue but i do think that 
something about what sets your heart on fire and the things that you tend to gravitate towards, the topics and the, if it's first responders, if it's policing or firefighter, whatever sort of starts to pull you, that natural gravitation towards a topic, I think that is a support, if not your primary purpose, it's a supportive role in, in as much as that you can start to investigate a little bit, pardon the pun, uh, into figuring out what it is that, that you, you know, want to go after. And, uh, and I think that along with, I, I wrote down a few words and, and I'd like to just kind of uh, say, if you're good with it, just to kind of talk about uh, what these words mean in under the umbrella of, of being a leader. And oh, by the way, you don't have to be this, this, this me, like me, I'm, I'm all like big open and, and my hands and everything. You don't need to be that extroverted person in order to be an effective leader. I know plenty of introverted people who are very quiet, but they make huge inroads and they make huge influence in people. And then that overall mission can get accomplished based on just the, their actions, which to some may seem very kind of quiet in, in a, in a sense, but yet in all, they can have this resounding in uh, resounding impact in the influence of the overall mission. So the first word that I wrote down and I think is, is completely vital to what leadership is and what maybe it isn't. And also the importance of leadership is the word communication. So Seb, if you don't mind, go on both sides of the coin when it comes to, okay, first talk about as the leader, how important that is to communicate to your team, but also as a teammate or as a follower, uh, how important it is for you to communicate back kind of up the chain for lack of a better term. Okay, so would you like me to talk about just some of the some of the, the must sort of leadership trait that this will actually feed into? Because if you want, I, I can do that quickly. Basically, we know and and bear in mind, I'm no psychologist, but there there are people way smarter than me. They've done all the research, and 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 it's there for the taking. So, so there's nothing. There's no sorcery involved here. It's 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 quite simple. We know for a fact that two two leadership traits or or personality traits are very very important in leadership. We're talking about conscientiousness, and we are talking about emotional intelligence. If you break down emotional intelligence, you have your self awareness, your self regulation. You have your motivation, you have your uh, social skills, and you have your empathy, right? So the good news is somebody says, well, I don't, have, I don't really have emotional intelligence. You know, I, I'm, you know I, I, I'm not sure. Well, you can work on all of those five components and get better at all of those things. I will take, for example, the, the example of communication that you have exemplified. Okay, so the person is not, perhaps is, an, is, a, is um, introverted, and that by default would be their own reaction. But if they're at least open to understand that things are going to need to be, you know, done in a different way in order to, for them to, I would say, fully grow as a leader and be as good as they, they possibly can be, they will have to learn to overcome that on a professional standpoint. Not that being an introvert is an issue, but it can be in communication, right? So what's going to happen is if the person knows that their social skills are either or either lacking for lack of a better term or they just prefer not having them but that it is sort of necessary in the in their function and in the role they're that they're in then they can work on that and you know place themselves out there and and go to the you know toastmasters or whatever and go do presentations for the public and and have uh, you know, courses that they can put together and, and presentations for wellness or whatever the case may be so that they get that extra practice because communication. And then if we start looking in the not to go everywhere here and there and everywhere, but there's, you know, information coming through a strainer here and it's literally everywhere. But if we're looking at the, the self-awareness piece, for example, well, that feeds into another of the traits of emotional intelligence. You know, this, that self-awareness piece where I know how I'm being perceived by others, how I speak, how my body language, how I come across. Therefore, I can self-regulate, which is, okay, I know that I come across strong. And I will give you an example. For me, it was always about intensity. I was intense amongst the most intense, right? And so that wasn't such a great trait it, it wasn't it it had a lot of positives but but it also turned people off so if people turn you off they're not listening to you and they're not having those conversations so i had to learn in my in my in my leadership growth to self-regulate my intensity i had to dial it back 
you know, seven, seven levels so that I could communicate with people and they would not feel like their life was in danger, you know, even though I never actually, you know, said anything threatening or anything, but it's just, it was very hard for some people to kind of take that. So, um, you know, to tie all this in, and I mean, I'm sure we'll touch on all these other um, elements of, of, of emotional intelligence, but I mean, yeah, communication is, is massive uh, in, in a variety of different ways. What are your communication styles? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? There are, th there are tests for that. You can test your people for that. You can have them take a quick, you know, however how many question, do a little, a little, little role play, little this, little that. Next thing you know, you know the leadership, sort of the, the communication style that is favored by each of your people, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, if you have 8,000, you may not have a chance to do that. But what are we talking about here? If you have 8,000, then you have people working for you, right? right. Yeah. So leadership, leadership at a very, very small microcosm is exactly the same on a large scale, sure. except along the way, there are more people involved in the process. So then what becomes important is for you to get a, an understanding, get some buy-in from the people that are directly below you, that get, that get buy-in from the people that are directly below them, and it goes down the chain. And you can still get an entire organization done and tested, and you can have all your leaders and your detachment commanders, if we're in a first responder world or in the police world, and you can have them know who their people are. And actually, the corporals and the sergeants on the watches, if we're in the context of policing, should know that. Mm -hmm. Because it will help steer how the communication, if something difficult has to be addressed or, or instead of, instead of, look, um, when I have a conversation with this person, it generally doesn't go so well. Um, you know, there was a, a bit of a, there was a bit of an incident that occurred here that should be discussed, but I will not because I know where this is going to go mm -hmm. versus, wait a minute, is there a way that this person can be communicated with and, and actually that I can reach that person and, 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 you know, have a productive conversation about what transpired and still have the tough conversation, but do it in a way that's acceptable mm. to both of us, right? Type deal. So inversely, you know, um, is exactly the same. If we're talking about, and it, it kind of leads into the open door policy, right? Like there, there's a lot of keywords. There's a lot of keywords being tossed around in leadership. You know, oh, I always had an open door, always had an open door. And, um, and the door is physically open, really. But when you walk in there yeah, and, yeah, you state, and, you, and, you, and you state your grievance, the person's ego gets bruised. They want to, you know, they want to, they want to justify, you know, they're not really listening anymore. They want to justify what it is that they did and why they did it. And it turns into something completely different. Mm -hmm. The person that comes in leaves, nothing was accomplished. Yes, the door was physically open, but your mind wasn't. So mm -hmm. you actually don't have an open door. If you're going to have an open door, perhaps let the person state their grievance what it is that you did or didn't do or that you could do better or whatever and sit on it. You don't need to communicate back immediately unless there's an immediate, you know, risk to life and limbs, uh, you know, at which case is a completely different scenario. But then for the person that comes in to say, last time I went in there, you know, he, he, the boss had said they had an open door policy. I walked in there and we attempted to have a conversation to let him know that he did this, 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 and that. And, uh, and he totally, you know, totally brushed it off and justified it. And I had to walk out of there and we're all pissed off and, you know, we, well, okay. So now we're looking at the other side of that coin. How did you approach that? Yeah. How, as a person that clearly was selected or self-identify as a leader, quote unquote, to go in there and have the tough conversation with the boss, how did you actually do that? You know, because you have a responsibility to know what kind of boss you have, you know, and, and that's, that's just, you actually do. And no, you don't really, but if you don't, you are, you are the one that will be paying for that. Mm -hmm. So you are much better to understand the leadership style of the person that you're working for so that you can then, and the communication style, so that you can then tailor your approach to having a tough conversation with that person. Mm. So it works both ways. This isn't a, you know, oh, the boss says that he has an open door policy, but when you get in there, this is what happens. I didn't do anything wrong. Deflection leads nowhere. Generally, mm. the truth is somewhere in the middle, 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just having the capacity and the ability to recognize that there are different leadership styles that, uh, sorry, the different communication style is getting late. <laughs> 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 and uh, we can actually learn from each other and, 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 and learn what each other, what's acceptable for each other. And then we can, you know, have the, have the tough conversations in a respectful manner. Um, I like that second side of the coin that you just touched on because that uh, something that's been going on in my own mind lately is that kind of self leadership. Like what am I doing? Uh, forget about giving the responsibility and expectation on, any, on everyone else, but what am I doing? What's Steve doing so that I can make the situation better? And that is, that has happened to me. That exact scenario has happened to me where you walk into a, a boss who had said, I have an open door. Sure. Come on in. Let's talk. And you do that. And then the presentation of, of the issue or how you kind of brought it up, um, all of a sudden it doesn't go the way you had sort of planned. And most of us, by the way, psychologically speaking, most of us do sort of play out everything on how we think it might go before we even step over the threshold of that open door. And the problem is that that kitty, that sort of paints you into this corner where now all of a sudden it's not going the way that you kind of thought or hoped or expected. And now it's like, oh my God, you know, what do I do now? And panic sets in and then your emotion, that emotional intelligence that you touched on all of a sudden now is skewed because of panic. Um, so I've had that where uh, I've had to kind of reassess myself and say, well, next time, how can I approach this issue? Uh, if it's important enough for me to go in and actually sort of uh, take that step and to discuss it, to, to grow from it and to kind of make sure it doesn't happen again, um, then it has to be important enough for me to do some due diligence in the beginning and to think, how can, how can I present this to my boss so that it can be um, sort of the ideal uh, outcome? And by the way, folks listening and watching, the ideal outcome isn't always or doesn't always line up to what you think that outcome should, should be. And uh, you have to be open to change. You have to be open to uh, the greater good. And even if your feelings or your ego gets a little bit wonky, you've got to be open to that. So uh, you, and I think that if I can just kind of plug in a little bit of a tried, tested and true way that you can sort of help yourself in this way is if you have an issue before you present that issue, unless, unless again, it's, it's paramount that you do it right now, which by the way, can be a detriment in and of itself. Sometimes we just got to chill out. If it's something that doesn't have to be brought in right now, maybe sit on it for a moment, sit on it for a day, sleep on it. But so getting back to my tip that you may be able to employ for your own life is uh, maybe watch with an understanding uh, of what it is you have in here that you got to get out. You got to get off this. I got to get this off my chest, but I got to speak to that boss. I would encourage you to just observe that boss in their daily interactions with other people. It might give you hints on how best to approach that person uh, with that open door policy. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's it, you know, ultimately this can all be a little bit self-serving. And when I say that is if it serves you well, it, was, it will evidently serve everybody else that you ever lead well. And one of the, you know, where this is applicable is if you have a leader that's a little bit more difficult to work with, Think of it as a as a one of those rubric uh, cubes. You know, I can't I can't pronounce that word. It's you know, it's those cubes with all the colors on it. I think you mean a Rubik's cube, um, friend. <laughs> that's right, that thing. Yeah. Sorry, I try not to, but sometimes I'm very French. So okay. so yeah. So 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 it's um it's exactly that. You know, like if you if every boss you've ever worked for and every one of your employees and people and your peers, the people you work with, and this doesn't even need to be people that work for you it could be people you're working with and you're figuring out what it is that they're all about and especially if they're working for you having you know what kind of gratification are they you know pr uh, what's their preferred you know style of gratification like some people like formal gratification other people like to be told consistently that they're doing a good job other people just like to be kind of left alone and spoken to from time to time other people don't need anything but they still evidently deserve something but you know and so once you're able to do this, that means that you can move in any positions and have various bosses and you, they don't need to be cookie cutter for you to do well mm -hmm. under them or um, working for them because you have an adaptability. And if you're flexible and have adaptability, guess what? 
that's going to pay dividend for you. It's going to make your life a lot easier. It's going to make your people's life a lot easier. You're going to get some buy-in and you're likely to get some buy-in from the, from the boss. And if you get buy-in from the boss, that allows you to have a voice, which you use on things that are critical and you don't, you don't waste it on absolutely fighting every single battle because mm -hmm. we know what happens when you fight every battle, uh, you lose your voice, no matter how, how uh, you know, on point your, your comments might be. Um, if you pick every battle that your crew wants you to take, uh, it's not going to work. So you need, and you need to tell, you need to be transparent with your people on that and say, look, you know, I, 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 will, I will fight for us on those things and I will take some heat over a variety of different issues. But this here isn't worth isn't worth the fight because we're gonna lose we're gonna lose our voice here. If I'm reasonable and we work together and there's give and take, when there is something that's truly critical and I approach the boss on it, he'll listen. He or she will listen. Mm -hmm. And 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 of course they might not. But then that's another problem. Why aren't they listening? Mm -hmm. Is that their problem or is it me? Have I have I done something? Have I done something that you know? So it always comes back to that introspection. What am I actually doing to make this better? Yeah, I like that. You know, when you talk about um, kind of picking your battles, and I think that's so important because what you have an opportunity to do in that situation is um, you, you will start to gain the trust. And that's the next word that I wanted to throw out to you. You start to gain the trust of those you work with because I know that there may be a lot of viewers who are watching this who say, I'm not a boss, so I need to keep my mind. So I want to say this goes a long way with who you're working with. Most of us work with someone. Somehow, somewhere we work with someone. And by, by choosing to say certain things and by choosing to not fight at everything and articulating your words and using your words, because words do matter, by the way, by articulating your words uh, appropriately, you can have the voice that will penetrate through maybe some stubbornness or it'll penetrate through some ego or, or what have you. But it won't do, it'll start to lose its edge if, yeah, if you're fighting on everything. Figure out first what really, really matters at the end of the day, what really matters. And then you're going to start to gain, uh, I think you're going to gain that respect from the people that you work with. And now all of a sudden, it's, they see that you are uh, a little bit more switched on or a little bit more kind of acute to the things that really matter. Because keeping the big picture in the big picture is, is vitally important. Too many of us, I think we fight these fights that at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect how I do my job. It doesn't affect how I am with my family. But um, if you start picking all these things and you start fighting all the time, then all of a sudden you are, you're not only going to burn yourself out, but you're also going to lose your voice. And so by gaining the trust of other people and to be transparent enough, to say, look, this is something that I don't think we need to be bothered. Maybe it's a scheduling conflict, or maybe it's a, a kit issue thing, or maybe it's a, you know, I wanted every other Saturday off and I can't get it. Should I go to the boss? And you know, whatever the whatever the thing is, uh, just choose your battles right because you're going to gain trust. And that's what I wanted to kind of bring to you, Seb, is that word trust about how important. I mean, we all know that the answer is very important, but maybe elaborate on that for for us if you can. Is that element of trust and, and how do you build that as a leader? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's, it is, it is critically important. Um, if, if I was to summarize it, you know, when I was a team leader on, on, on the emergency response team, um, there isn't anything in my professional career that ever came close to when I knew beyond a reasonable doubt that I had that my guys trusted me a hundred percent and that the people above us trusted me a hundred percent and that both of those groups wanted me in that position. Mm. There is nothing in, in terms of professional fulfillment than having their family know that I would never expose them to unnecessary harm. That if something happened, I had done everything I could possibly do to mitigate the risk for them. They all knew that they all trusted and I can tell you, man, couldn't care less what the rank on my shoulder was, couldn't care less what my paycheck was. There is nothing that will ever match that, right? So how do you do that? Well, it starts, it starts by learning, uh, by gaining credibility through demonstrated competence. That's mm -hmm. rule number one. You have to demonstrate competence in whatever field of endeavor that you're in. And that is yours to take. It's there. You can, you can always get better. All you need is to be coachable, to research, to ask, 
and to follow through with whatever help you're getting, right? So if I'm asking you how to do something and you've provided me with some valuable input, some of which maybe doesn't apply because perhaps it just doesn't work with me or whatever, you know, for whatever reason, but I will take something positive from everybody I work with and, and, and create the best product that I can on what I know. Mm-hmm. Now, there are, we could launch into the levels of competence, like the unconscious incompetence, the conscious incompetence, and, you know, because there's five different levels. And then the ultimate goal is to reach unconscious competence, which is everything you do is done right, but you just don't know why. It's just it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and oftentimes the reasons are you are the type of person that's sought the information. You are the type of person that's responds well to critical feedback. You are the type of person that doesn't get their, their ego bruised when somebody says you could do this better or whatnot. In fact, you may always be reassessing your own actions and say, you know, I think I could have done this better. And then I'm the one seeking the information. Once you're, cap- once you're wanting to do that and once you're open and your mind is open and you're, you're, you, there, there are always subject matter experts in everything you do. So even if you were someone that struggles and there are people out there and I struggle with certain things and there are people out there that may be struggling with certain aspect of their job, there, there is always, if they're the hardest worker in the room there is, and there's a will, there is always a way to get those things sorted. Before you start leading people, you better be squared away. You better be squared away and have demonstrated that competence and be, be humble about that competence. Obviously, it's not for you to, you're not selling your competence. You're demonstrating your competence through daily activities, mm-hmm. right? So it's very different. I'll give you an example. Like if I come in and we've spoke, I, I believe we might have spoken about this at one point in, uh, in our first um, video. But if I come in and I say I was taking over a team somewhere else and despite them knowing me and knowing what my background is and everything, I would not try to um, impose competence on them. You know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't walk in there and be like, okay, guys, I'm competent. So um, I just want you guys to know that, you know, I've done this and this and this and this and nobody cares, right? right. You're only as good as what you did yesterday and today. And, um, and I think having the attitude that you're a, a, you're a, a constant learner and somebody that can always get better, but also demonstrating your competence through your everyday duties um, without having to project it. You're actually just doing your job and you're doing it professionally and you're asking for input and you're doing all of this, taking into consideration other people's input, which is absolutely critical, even though you likely know what the, what the answer is to a problem that you're trying to solve. If you're, if you're getting people involved in it, they become part of the process. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're a, if you're, a, a, you know, in a, in a first responder world or in the police world, if you're a constable on the road and, um, and you start leading calls and, and bringing people, um, lead, leading people for like a better terms, um, as long as you sort of do one thing at a time, you're, you're kind of controlled, you get people's input. If somebody says, Hey, I can take this corner, I can do this, or I can go you know, set up containment. And if you, if you believe that that's the, the next priority, then by all means, let them take care of it. Okay. You're in charge of containment. You make sure that this place is locked down, you know, type deal. Mm-hmm. So, but what you have done is you've either demonstrated your own competence or you've accepted other people's competence and you've actually enabled them to do the work, which also leads to the same establishing some trust. Mm-hmm. That person trusted me. What happened when somebody trusts you? You actually have them now. You now have a professional and personal responsibility to 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 live up to what it is that they <laughs> entrusted you with, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's it, you know, and and once you have once you have credibility established through demonstrated competence, then then you you know you, you, organically people are gonna you're gonna have some gravitational pull over mm-hmm. the people, and if you just so happen to be um, wanting to lead officially and have a position at one point just make sure that you've been there long enough and you've demonstrated that you know because that prevents animosity and it you know just just do your homework and and do it when you're ready Mm. type deal man i love what you said about your competence you said uh well what i heard anyways was you don't need to be a salesperson to sell or to sell your competence you need to be a demonstrator and demonstrate your competence. 
I love that. I love that. Too many people are barking about, look what I can do or look what I did. I found myself sometimes, you know, if you're proud of something that you've accomplished in the past, you know, oh yeah, back when I, you know, you start to say, you start to say these stories with an intent. If I'm honest, if I'm being, uh, we're talking about not deflecting things, but talk, talking about in, you know, looking inward, it's, it's an, it's an attempt to gain someone's trust through past experiences that they had nothing to do with anyway. And so I love that. That's speaking to my own soul about just demonstrate, um, demonstrate your competence through every day. What did you do today? You know, that, that would, uh, that would work, you know, seven, you, you and I had a phone conversation and there are certain little things that I've hooked onto in my life that have been paramount to, to my ability to uh, affect change in, in my own self. And one of the things that you said to me is, um, you said, be uncompromising in the delivery and the quality of your service. And that was huge for me because it started to change the thing that I did, the thing that I was presenting is in my case, being a, being a police officer. So those files that I work on, the investigations that I am leading, it, it wasn't about so much of what other people wanted to see or what I could get away with the bare minimum of just doing or even, even the foresight to think, well, this is, you know, the, the, the famous line, well, this isn't going anywhere anyway, so I may as well just, and then you kind of, because that I think is short, and I've done that, and I think it's been short changing myself into the potential growth that I have as a leader, and that is to say, be uncompromising in the delivery of the quality of your delivery and quality of the thing that you do. So uh, I applaud that. So that's huge. Be a, don't, don't be a salesperson for your competence, but rather be a demonstrator. And um, the last word that I wanted to give you today is uh, the, I wrote down the word teachability and you said the word coachability. I think they're very, very similar, but uh, just touching on teachability, the importance of, uh, where that fits inside of a leader's role, especially those leaders who are in a position, uh, maybe maybe they have an active role and that role requires leadership, uh, but how important and how vital it is to be teachable or coachable in that role. Well, you know, this kind of leads into, uh, this kind of leads into who is, who is qualified to self-assess as being competent, right? In my opinion, nobody. Hmm. You know, it's that simple. How you perform as a leader isn't up to you. Hmm. Like, you don't know that. You, you just don't. So you're going to have, you know, and that's when, um, and this can be contentious, and I get that, but I don't care. Like, that's the reality. What are your, what is being said about you? Not, you know, based on personality conflicts or any of those frivoli frivolities of, uh, you know, high school or whatever, hmm. but actually the what how is the bulk of it how is the bulk of your people perceiving your leadership your communication your your you, you know you, you, like the mission like do they understand it clearly do they do they understand the parameters do they understand you know do, do they feel trusted do they feel that they have a say all these other things how do you how do you get that well you get that by asking right mm -hmm. so one of the things that i used to do with my guys when i was on the team is i would bring sheet in there and I would sit him in there for like an hour and say hey boys you guys are going to find three things that I can do better as a leader and you're not leaving this room until you're doing it you know kind of thing and they would laugh because they would be like come on man like you know you're a good boss we're you, you, there's whatever like it's you know because they they're not wanting to tell me anything because you know they generally like me and they generally know I, I care for them a lot and and they don't want to hurt my feelings. I'm like, no, you have to write something that I can do better. And so what they would do is I would get, say, 20 guys in there writing this thing, and then I would pick it up. And there was five of them that had the same thing. What have I just done? Like I just found something, despite them wanting to protect my feelings and despite them wanting to protect me and, and you know, sh show that they appreciate me and I appreciate it back and all this good stuff. I learned something that I could do better as a, as a, as a leader. And I actioned that. And six months later was this, the six months later was the same question. Has this changed? Has this improved? Mm -hmm. Right? So we have, we have certain processes, you know, organizationally that, that lead us to do that. But at times we're being selective. Okay. 
pick the people that are going to refer, that are going to comment on your leadership style. Well, that defeats the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to pick the people that are commenting because it's no different than sending you references. Like it's very unlikely that I would send you a reference that that reference will give us, will give, give you a bad you know, assessment of who I am, because otherwise I wouldn't have approached them in the first place if there was contention there. So I do, I do think that that is absolutely critical that whoever assess, whoever's in the position, seek the feedback consistently on how they're doing in, in terms of, in terms of performance as a leader and what can be done better. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, like, oh, you're great, you're great, you're great. Okay, cool. Is there anything I can do better? Mm -hmm. You know, type deal. So I'm sorry I went on this tangent for so long that I forgot what that question was. <laughs> no, the, the question was uh, talking about that person, like how, how important is it to be coachable and teachable? And, that, and that's a great example. Like here you are leading a group of people into okay. very dangerous situations and uh, you are demonstrating that you are in a position that, hey, I don't have it all together. And I don't know everything, and uh, but it's important. And it's more important to me, uh, even beyond because no one likes to get words of discouragement. No one wants to. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't. You read a sheet of paper that I didn't know. I I stunk at this, that, and the other. But when you put the the desire of the mission and the people that you're in that mission with above those potential hurt feelings, I think that in a nutshell is being teachable. You're right. I'm not going to send a reference. Uh, hey, will you be a reference for me for this? If, if I know that you and I don't get along, I'm just simply not going to do it. But I think to get a true evaluation of where you are, um, because I think you need to know where you are before you start heading somewhere. Uh, I think you're going to, you're going to best do that by, I like that. Here's a piece of paper, write down three things that I can do better. And then when you collect those things, um, you can kind of have, if there's a pattern, especially if you see a pattern, then maybe that's something that you want to address. But it kind of comes in long, uh, comes along with a, a principle that I, uh, that I like to practice also is the idea that being a leader, um, even if you're in a role or not, people may not, like you may not be liked by everybody by making some of those, those decisions. So it was just kind of that importance of being coachable or teachable when you're in a position of leadership. For sure. But I mean, again, it, this comes down to buy-in, right? And so I can guarantee you that if communication is clear and effective, and if, if you have your powder dried and you have done due diligence and you are capable of articulating yourself in a proper way with your people, you are very likely to get buy-in from the hardest, from those that are the hardcores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one person, you won't change. Okay. And that's cool. You don't change that one person, but I tell you what, whether you have one or six negative people on your, on your team is a big difference. Mm. One is a muted voice. Everybody else is pulling in the same direction. That person, it will be very uncomfortable for them if everybody else is very positive. And it'll, they, it will be less conducive to them just unloading on people. But if you, have, if you have six people that didn't get it, because you, not because they didn't get it, but because you couldn't communicate it effectively mm -hmm. and you couldn't get buy-in on something critical, you now have six people going around ragging on the decision you've made or whatever, which is completely undermining your leadership, but it also creates that negative environment that you don't want your people to be coming to work to. Mm -hmm. Because it does affect people. It, you know, the, the, the work environment is, is hugely critical. And if you think, if you think of collective resilience, and, and there is such thing as collective resilience, basically, if you, if you set a culture of respectful culture in, in your team or, or in your work environment, and it's very positive, and you have your jokers that are respectful, but you have your, you know, and, and, and people want to come to work and all this good stuff, it is absolutely incredible what it does when that little cup is being filled with administrative, you know, weirdness and operational disasters and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, bad moody characters and negative talk and backstabbing and all these other things. And then eventually a big incident occurred. Boom. So what you did is you've overflown that cup and you did that by allowing the cup to get filled by a whole bunch of of the, you know, of, of, of impediment that shouldn't have been in there in the first place, period. Uh, so the more positive the work environment is, the more room there is in that cup. So when the big, the big call hits or when the big incident hits, you guys can work together through your positive work 
environment and problem solve these things and get these get these people that want to come back to work come back to work healthy mm-hmm. right not necessarily drag this home and and you can have your process in place and take care of them and all this good stuff but again in terms of teachability if you are if you are and there's a saying that you know a good leader learns from their mistake and a better leader le- learns from everybody else's mistake. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to be open to feedback. You have to be open to talk to other people. You have to be considering other, t- other ways to do business. Mm-hmm. You have to be reading. You have to be listening to the podcast. You have to be li- uh, re- uh, you know, listening to the audio book instead, be- instead of being on YouTube, you know, or unless you're on, of course, the Real Cop, Real Life channel. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what I'm saying? So the interesting thing with leadership and with people that have an affinity for it is, is, is oftentimes they will be the one that seek additional knowledge. Mm. The people that truly have, have a, a problem with leadership or are not interested in getting better or simply are oblivious, rather, um, will generally not seek it out. Mm-hmm. So now... As a leader, you need to have that in the back of your mind. I need to be consistently learning. I need to. So how the, what kind of medium I'm going to use to do that and who I'm going to go to is completely up to you, but you should be learning things because this thing is evolving. It's an evolving concept. It's evolving concepts all intertwined, right? And we're discovering more and more as we go. You know, I, I love I love the military as far as a parallel goes with leadership because it's sort of um, it's sort of a real tangible understanding of some of that that stuff. And I can tell you, I don't know anything about military. I think it's it's I, I respect and honor those who serve and who have, have served. And I know that you have uh, you were in the military some twenty years ago, um, and that's fantastic. But what, but I love the parallels with leadership because it's so kind of. Um, it's so it's an understanding parallel and uh, you know Jesus himself would always use these parallels and he would speak a language to the people that they would understand so you're not going to talk to fishermen about farming you know you're not going to talk to farmers about how to build a house but you're going to get that parallel that makes sense for them in the military for me the way that it helps me understand is is just that you are going to have leadership in the military who are going to learn about the enemy, learn about the territory, learn about what, you know, what weapons and, and objections and, and, you know, what, what am I going to come against? Because then when the soldiers who are going to put boots on the ground, when, when they walk into a room, they're going to get, you know, briefed about what's going to happen. Before you can get briefed about anything that's going to happen, there has been a vision that has been established by somebody who said, I don't know things yet, I'm going to learn and I'm going to grow before I, I take a team into whatever we're going into. And so, um, so I, I love the military's aspect on that tangibility when it comes to understanding what it is. Look, you, you got, before I go, before I buy into someone as a leader, they have got to demonstrate that competence that we just talked about. And, uh, and, and once they do that, I'm on board. You know, I'm on board with you. And when you say that we need to go east and then go this far and then to do this and that and the other thing, okay, that's what I'll do because you have shown me in the past that you have learned and you have grown and you've communicated that. And that's why some of those key words were so important today, but they've, they've communicated uh, what the vision was, what the mission was so that we can collectively pull in that same direction. When you talk about having six people in, in say, an office environment who uh, are just, you know, pulling in all directions, I think of a tug of war, you know, you ever play that game tug of war where uh, you, you need to have someone there to establish, okay, you guys are going to pull that way and you guys and girls are going to pull that way. And if you don't have that and you just throw a bunch of people into a, into a ring and say, go ahead and start pulling, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you are to use your your your, your greatest asset, which is your people, um, you're gonna have to have that so that you can establish sort of what the intent is and let them flow and problem solve things for you. You don't need as a leader to you don't need to know it all. You don't need to be. You'll have your various subject matter experts in a various you know field of endeavors within your profession, and uh, and you should be trusting upon those people to make the calls to make the critical decisions to give you the information that you need to ultimately make a call perhaps but you you know i just i just love i mean and we evidently this is going to go on and on we can launch in a variety of different things but 
I would say, demonstrated competence and care, right? Care. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing what we can accomplish as leaders when people know you care about them because it establishes your character. It establishes your character and it says, look, if there is a very shifty, shifty decision that came through and I don't fully understand it, but Stephen or Seb made it, guaranteed there was reasons for that. Yeah, I just know, you know, because you've established you've established your character as a leader. So there is less of fighting the negative insurgency um, when you've already established yourself as a leader and people know now, you know what, Seb is he's, he's generally has a lot of common sense and, and he cares for people. So I would be very surprised if that's what happened. So mm -hmm. let's wait and let's see or let's find out, you know, mm -hmm. give him a call and let's find out, you know, type deal. For so sure. you're getting grace. You're getting grace. So care is huge. So competence, because I mean, we didn't extrapolate on that a bit earlier, but I mean, demonstrated competence is one thing, but I think, I don't think I went any deeper, but evidently care is, is huge. I love Empathy, it. care, it's all in the spirit of, of emotional intelligence, right? Yeah, it's, it is. Uh, so Seb, what I, had, what I had done in the past is I had uh, presented some of our, uh, our audience with a question and uh, moving forward, um, I want to invite in this moment that if there are any questions out there, go ahead and put those in the comments because I am, uh, I am very active, as active as I can be with, uh, with responding to these comments. Um, and you, if you have questions about leadership or you have a sort of a, maybe something where you just need a little guidance or you just have a, a thought, something, go ahead and put those down below and I'll make sure that uh, moving forward, because this is going to be a multiple episode sort of uh, indulgence, but I will make sure that Seb and I uh, look at those questions and if we don't know the answer or if we have some sort of uh, misunderstanding, we'll clear that up first and we'll present, um, we'll present the best answer that we possibly can. But before we go, uh, Seb, I did, I did present a question about a month ago and I said, what is important to you, the audience, as, as a leader? And I had many, uh, and I'll read through a couple of them, you know, patience and understanding, uh, remembering where they came from. Uh, people skills, things like that. But there was one that I just wanted to highlight, and you sort of started getting to it there at the end of uh, at, at the end of that last topic. But it's this person said the ability to make people feel like they matter. So if you can just sort of before we close about that, and you were sort of getting into that, uh, but you know the importance of knowing that the people that are w working with you or working for you that they matter. I don't want to sound cheesy, but let's put it this way. Once it's all said and done and you're on your deathbed, if you have the opportunity to be there and you contemplate what's happened in your life, nobody will care, nor will you what you've actually achieved professionally. But what you will care about and what other people will care about is how you made people feel. Yeah. That's good. Your entire life, how have you made people feel? Hmm. And if you think that that's not rewarding, you have never been there before. It is extremely rewarding. It's more rewarding than any medal you can get. It's more rewarding than any, you know, certificate of excellence or promotions or whatever. Trust me on that. People look at you different. The energy that emanates from them is different and you are going to feel different. Hmm. So, Caring for your people, and it, it's not about giving the impression that you care for your people, is actually caring for your people. The biggest asset for caring for people is empathy, right? What are they going through? How can I relate to it? And if I don't have the experience, how can I find out what this actually does to a person? So I'll give you an example, divorce. So say you have an employee that's missed a couple of days or, or, or maybe the performance has dropped and you know, evidently you're not gonna think like that person was a good worker and, 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 and somehow something happened. So you're, first of all, you're going to want to find out like, Hey, w w you know, is there anything going on? I just, I just noticed that perhaps you're, you're off a little bit or, you know, whatever and find out. So say for example, you never experienced a divorce yourself. You may not know that some people would prefer going to war than going to another divorce. Mm -hmm. And this is no word of a lie. This is coming straight from, you know, psychologists and you know, the, Divorce can create more stress on a person than battle in, in some instances. <laughs> and it's not to take anything away from anybody that's been to battle, but I, a lot of those people 
people actually went through divorce as well. But it's just it's just to show what kind of impact that this may have. So if I cannot empathize with a certain event because I've never been through it, I've never felt what it feels like, my relationship is either really happy or it's benign, so it really doesn't matter, you know, either way, but I don't relate to this person. Maybe I need to find out how much stress does divorce because can divorce um, cause a person. And once I've done this, I can now go back to this, this person and said, hey man, or hey, you know, woman or whoever, um, you know, I, 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 I looked into this and, and, and I can't believe the amount of stress that this can cause a person, you know, like, and you can have that conversation and it, and it is amazing. And then, then, you know, it, it just bleeds into critical incident post care and recovery and everything like you just need to be an astute learner that wants to know and that and that truly cares for your people like it's your job you have taken the chevron or you have taken the whatever position you're the captain of the fire hall or you're this or you're that those people's lives are on you mm. go out there and lead something you know lead them lead them into wellness I don't care how much work you have to you have to put in. If you generally don't like people, then perhaps you should have been something else mm -hmm. than the job you're in right now. And that's you know that might be a realization that you're going to come to. But the people that we have in place, we need them to be like that. It doesn't mean that all decisions you make will be unanimous, as we discussed earlier, and it just isn't going to be, and that's fine. But if but if the people know you make things you, you make things happen out of care, then they will not question those little those little things along the way so much. But man, you know, have care for them, they will care for you back. And what happens when they care for you, they work twice as hard and, and they make sure that it, you know, and ultimately who benefits from that? We all do, but you do too as a leader. Your team will make you look good. And it, it, I guess there's a, there's another side to this, but let's let's leave it at that for today. But ultimately, work for them; they will work for you, and it, it'll be a, a symbiotic relationship, made in heaven type deal. You know. You know, I've always said with some hiccups. <laughs> for sure. Well, I was just gonna say, where I've always said that where there are people, there are problems, and that's just the fact of the matter. Um, and it's it's been said that if you care for your people, your people will care for your business, and then your business will flourish. Um, and so. I would just like to end it on kind of one last thought, and um, and that is simply this: is that when we're talking about leadership, we're talking about people. All right, I I uh, I've worked for people who have been in positions where I will follow them to where the position uh, starts and ends and no more. But I've also worked for people who I've bought into their leadership because they've shown me they're competent, they've bought my trust, they have communicated with me, they've done all of those things that I, I have surpassed that position, but instead I bought into the person that they are and to the leader that they are. And, uh, and I think that moving forward and going on through, we're gonna open up and dissect some more leadership topics and principles. And some of that I hope is influenced by you, the watcher, the person who is watching this. And hey, listen, if Joe Rogan can have a three and a half hour podcast and be successful, then there's no reason why Steven Seb can't go an hour here on YouTube and, and be successful. But uh, that's just the truth of the matter, man. Where there are people, there are problems, but that's what leadership is all about. It's about uh, solving problems and using people to do it and, and understanding that that is your greatest asset, the people that you work for, or the people that work for you and the people that you work with. Um, so knowing that and moving forward into this leadership, you know, uncensored, um, any, any final words on, on that, Seb, as, as far as this kind of first introduction to leadership? Yeah, I would say we, we merely scratched the surface, okay? So, so bear with us. We merely scratched the surface. There's a ton more to be discussed. Um, and, and we are going to get to absolutely everything or almost everything uh, over, over time. But we just, if we get sucked in in an hour video every time, like we're going to lose the audience. So it's just, I think it's, it's best that we do it in, in shorter segments. And that's it. Leadership, what it is, what it isn't, and why it is so important. Anyways, friends, listen, from, from uh, Seb and Steve in this session, I just, I hope I wish you well. And as we say here in Real Cops for Real Life, always, always be aware of your surroundings.